So we're going to begin with our, our short lecture before we do the MCQ questions. So this is a short lecture I'm giving. So we classify bacteria as according to the oxygen requirement too. So obligate error would mean that they must have oxygen for them to survive. You can see the examples. Facultative anaerobes can survive with or without oxygen. You can see the examples. Micro aerophilic, they require little amount of oxygen. Yes. Classic example, Helicobacter pylori, Crocodocostrion, Capnophilic, but if you just know Capnophilic, they survive or they thrive in high concentration of carbon dioxide. Obligate anaerobes, they do not require oxygen. Yes, I can see their examples. So, classification by temperature. So, if they are mesophiles, it means they survive in our, the normal body temperature of human beings, so 37 degrees Celsius. Thermophiles, this is the temperature, yes, greater than 42, and psychrophiles, low. Now, that is why when there's an infection, yes, there's fever, increase of body temperature, so that, as you can see, most bacteria fall under the mesophiles. Yes, I can see it's highlighted in, it's, it's in the bold caps, for you to know that most bacteria stay in this range so when there's a fever most of them cannot survive so the main part of this lecture is the lab diagnosis so in the lab diagnosis as you can see they are divided into four so bacteriology to examine bacteria yes now um if crop talk about um, um they are talking about a bacteria that they used the tintorial properties or the staining properties and they ask what method of lab diagnosis is this of course it's, it's bacteriology yes if we talk about the culture and they ask you what lab diagnosis this cultural and you can see so on and so forth yes virology is to detect only viruses yes because viruses they need a, a live host yes they need to put their dna into the dna of the chicken embryo or an, or an animal for them to be able to survive they hijack it yes we know that viruses without a host is practically not living yes so virology, these are the examples. So if you see a question where there's a virus and Croc asks you what um, way should you diagnose it? Yes, they will put a bunch of other tests. Yes, if there's PCR, yes, PCR can detect virus. But if there's no PCR and they put a lot of bunch of tests, just go forward. Once you see no, it's a virus, these are your tests. Serology, I am not even hear serology, I want you to think serum. Yes, you know our serum contains antibodies, but don't hold on to that very well. I'll, I'll explain why very soon. But just keep that in your mind, yes? We have different methods, immunofluorence, agglutination, precipitation, ELISA, neutralization test, and the complement section test, also known as Wasserman test. Now, we'll explain all these tests in the serology um, part. Molecular genetics, as I said, PCR, yes? And RT-PCR, you can check the full meaning of it, yes? Later. Now, before I talk about this, look here. But they're just specimen legs for bacteriological examination or, or bacteriological lab diagnosis what are the specimen we need if there is sepsis or fever we need to take the blood yes if there's sepsis or fever we, we don't need to start taking the um the nasal swab or you know in, in an emergency case the first thing you need to take is the blood if there's sepsis or fever that's the first thing you need to take focus on that yeah they're not going to go too deep if they're talking about uh, nasopharyngeal inflammation, of course, we need to take the nasopharyngeal swab, yes. If they're talking about the gastrointestinal, if the, um, there's a patient presents with gastrointestinal issues like vomiting, um, then dysentery or diarrhea, we need to take the feces, yes. If a patient comes with immunogenital problems like urinary pain, of course, you need to take the um, urine. If the person comes with um, vaginal discharge or penal discharge yes you need to take the discharge the eyes you can so on and so forth so you can see the classification of bacteria you can check for yes so please know that then now we're moving to of course serology i told you i'll explain the serology in detail so you can see there are five important steps you need to know so let me quickly do this um immunofluorence so immunofluorence test is express diagnosis what do i mean by that it's very fast it's very quick if croc tells you you need a very fast test a quick test or an express diagnostic test, your answer will be immunofluorence. Yes. Now, now me, um, medicine is changing. The As medicine is improving, they are cutting this test out. You don't need to know this test to be a doctor. But let's move on. Unfortunately, we have to learn it. So what is the direct and indirect immunofluorence tests? Yes. Now, 
let me show you what they're talking about. So as the name implies, you know Florence, yes, um, there's a, uh, I don't know if this English is correct, but there's a fluorescent structure which gives this um, illuminescence, yes, or a light. So what is the difference between direct or indirect? So this is direct, this primary is direct, secondary is indirect. So in primary, you can see that this is the antigen, yes. What happened is, okay, we suspect there's an antigen, maybe we suspect, for example, don't put this in your mind, please, now. We suspect there is, let's say, uh, syphilis. Yes, I'm just guessing. Now, what we can do is we know we have synthesized um, antibodies to syphilis antigen in the lab. And so we bind that antibody, or I said antibody in the beginning because sometimes I make mistakes. Again, antigen, we suspect there's an we, sus we suspect a uh, syphilitic antigen. Yes, already in the lab we have made antibodies or where they got it from to syphilis antibodies. So we bind these antibodies to a uh, fluorescent emitting light structure. Yes, and then we put it. If this person really had that syphilitic antigen. Of course, the antibody will bind to the antigen, yes. And then when we look at it in the microscope, we're going to see this glow. But if it does, if it, uh, the patient doesn't have this antigen, it will just because they will accumulate, yes, they will aggregate, and it's not just one that's giving light. If there's a lot of aggregation to give a brighter light, yes. But if the patient doesn't have it, they will just be scattered around, and you will not really see any bright light. Good. Then in the indirect, what happened is, um. What we do is there is the antigen. We give the primary antibody first, yes. Then we make a secondary antibody that has that fluorescent emitting light. So I want you to know that the second antibody doesn't bind to the antigen. It binds to the first antibody, known as the primary antibody. And the reason why, is why we, we mostly use the indirect is because you can see that for just one antigen now, we have two what, fluorescent um emitting objects so it's be it's be more um specific it's be more um sensitive yeah it's be more sensitive you get it good so now that we know that that we've done that let's do elisa test now elisa test is also known as exam linked immunosorbent assay so it means that there's an enzyme that have been leaked there's an enzyme in this process yes when do we use elisa we use elisa test when the antigen load is very low. Yeah, so um, the antigen load in this patient is very low, and we need to confirm our diagnosis. Yes, yeah, so ELISA test. If it's fast, it would be immunofluorescence. So how do we do the ELISA test now? Okay, ELISA test is a very interesting test. I want you to know that ELISA test is a quantitative and qualitative test. Briefly, you can see how the test looks. You can see that some parts are very blue, some parts are not so blue. So the parts that are very blue, as you can see, the parts that are very blue, yes, it, because what happens, they dilute the um, serum, yes, they dilute the serial dilution, um, they dilute it so that, as you can see, this um, really um, blue place means there's a lot of um, viral load. The really light place means there's not a lot of viral load, but let's focus on the direct and indirect ELISA test. So, in the direct ELISA test, what happened is this test tube, this is a test tube now. In the direct, what happened is this test tube are coated, this has been made in a lab, yes, that are coated with specific antibodies. Now, of course, antigen will be added, yes, then an antibody will be, an antigen, maybe antibody, they are added. But the important thing is that this antibody will be bounded to a substrate. Sorry, again, this antibody will be binded to an enzyme. After that, they put a substrate. So if there's, a, just when they put a substrate, you don't need to know in details, we are not a micro, microbiologist, you just need to know that you have to differentiate them. But in indirect ELISA, what do you notice? There's a reverse here. Instead of the um, test tube to be coated with antibodies, what is it coated with? Antigen. That was the difference you need to know. You don't need to know the exact mechanism. We're not microbiologists. Okay, the next test we need to focus on will be the agglutination, precipitation, complement fixation, and neutralization. Agglutination tests, please, what is the difference between agglutination and precipitation? Look here. 
Agglutination means the adhesion of particulate antigen. What do I mean by particulate antigen? This antigen is not soluble. So they are mostly found on cell, cellular structures or cellular structures. Okay. Look here. This um due, because these antigens are insoluble, yes, because they are particulate, let's say they are particulate, they are insoluble. The, when they bind with antibodies, because all of them have antibodies and antigens, when they bind to antibodies, they will what? They will produce a clumping or granular. I don't want to use sediments, but a clump, they will clump together. Let's put clump. Now, and it's always in the presence of electrolytes, but precipitation is a soluble antigen. And when what happens is that if there's the antigen and antibody binding, what happens is this um, reaction will precipitate, it will go down the tube. But if, if you remember in the ABO blood group, yes, when you are testing, when you mix different blood groups and you're trying to check if it matches, that process, you see that it's what it will clump together. That's agglutination. But precipitation is to be in a test tube and if there's a reaction, it will go down. Okay, but focus on it to be soluble antigen. Do you need to know the definition? Yes. What also do you need to focus on? Please, the examples. So we have the indirect and direct hemagglutination. How do we differentiate the indirect and direct? Yes, that's another thing to focus on. Now, look here. Indirect hem hemagglutination, what happened is, please, this is very important, a virus must contain hem agglutinin um, substances. So these hem agglutinin substances in the virus bind to the red blood cell. Yes. And then when there's an antibody, the antibody will bind to this um, bind to this, um, is it purple? This purple, yes, purple thing, and then there will be the agglutination. But in indirect here, what happened is we synthesize or we artificially put this antigen on the cellular structure we want to examine. So we, the only difference is that we put it there, this ourself, yes, it's processed. Okay, next. So look at the examples, please. So an example of agglutination test is the wider test for typhoid, the right test for brucellosis, and the um, for also for pertussis or whooping cough. And sometimes you can also use to check diphtheria um, immunity. Yes, remember there's a question we did in the first lecture when we were talking about how to check the um, post-vaccine immunity. And we said uh, and we said it was serology. Yes, as you can see, the agglutination is a serological examination. Okay. The next um, lecture, precipitation. Please, these are the two things you need to know. You need to know about the ring precipitation. It's used for asco. It's also known as the ascolis test, and it's used for anthrax diagnosis. Then the um, precipitation in gel or agar is used for the detection of diphtheria toxin, also known as the toxic toxigenicity test. Yes, very important. Good. This is also known as Elix test too. Okay. What does it, what does this ring test imply? Look here. Look. It just means that when you look at it in a test tube, can you see that there's a ring formation in the middle? Yes, there's a ring formation in the middle. That's what he's talking about. Then that is the ring. Then the precipitation means that it will look like this. It will form a line. It will form a line. Can see precipitine line. That's what you need to know. The line, and this is, and line is for diphtheria, ring is for um, anthrax. Complement fixation test. Also, um, the classic example of a complement fixation test is Wasserman test. And we use Wasserman test for syphilis. Very important point. But it's an old test. We don't use this anymore. How does complement fixation test work? Now, it's better to know that this um, test is in two stages. Important point. Two step. The first step is, um, we boil the person's, we boil this patient's serum, but just enough to kill only the complements. Yes. Why do they do this test? Because let's assume we suspect this patient have uh, an infection to syphilis. Yes. The body will make antibodies to syphilis. So we suspect because we can see chancre, we can see the classic sign of syphilis. So we need to, because you always need to confirm your diagnosis. You can't just say because you saw chancre. Yes. You need to confirm. So we know that the body would have made antibodies. Bodies. 
So we take this serum, or the microbiologist will take this serum. Now, we'll come to the norm, how, the, how the normal, this is pathological now, this patient has antibodies to syphilis. So how do we confirm the diagnosis? Yes. So you can see we boil the patient's um, serum, we kill the complement first, because well, we don't kill the antibodies, we only kill the complement first. Why do we kill the complement first? Because um, human beings' complement system, the amount of complement system that we have varies very greatly, and we need a fixed um, range to be able to determine our test. So that's why we boil it, so we remove it. Then we put a synthetic complement system, an antigen. So remember that complement fixation can only occur when antibody and antigen complex. Remember from um, pathophysiology, I told you that complement activation or fixation can only occur in an antigen and antibody was complex. And you can see here, because there was an antibody, antigen will bind to it and then the complement will fix. Okay, but how do we know? Because we can't see this here. This, uh, they are both, um, even if they put it here in color, in the microbiologist lab, everything will be looking white, um, not white, transparent, like a transparent fluid. So how do we confirm that this patient will have syphilis. What they do next is they put a sheep red blood cell, very important, a sheep red blood cell. And of course, you know, red blood cell have what antigens. And they put an antibody to this sheep red blood cell. Now, of course, the antibody will bind to the sheep uh, red blood cell, yes, in the serum, but nothing will happen. The water will still be clear. Okay, yes, no, that will not be clear. The water will be clear, but the red blood cell will sediment to the bottom. Yes, why? Okay, why will it sediment to the bottom? Let's go to the normal one. So in a patient that didn't have syphilis, yes, when we boil, we remove the complement system. So this patient didn't have syphilis, so this patient didn't make antibodies to syphilis. When we put the complement system and the antigen, what happened next? There will not be any fixation because we don't have antibodies. But how do we confirm it? Because to so the microbiologist, it's just looking at liquid. They will put a sheep red blood cell and an antibody to sheep red blood cell. Of course, the antibody will bind to the um, sheep red blood cell that with the antigen, yes. And now the complement will bind to the uh, sheep red blood cell and the antibody to the sheep red blood cell and fix it. So it will forget about this antigen here because there was no antibody to bind with it in the first place, remember. So when complement fixes to red blood cell, what happened? Lysis. So the, what the microbiologist will see is that the tube will turn pink because the, the, all the red blood cells will just lyse. But in the, that's negative, so this person didn't have syphilis. But in positive, what will happen is because of this complement system have already been used up, yes, um, this red blood cell won't lyse and to sediment the bottom. So the lysis will be negative, very important. When there's no lysis, when there's um, sedimentation, it will be positive. That's what you need to know. Neutralization um, reaction, you don't need to know. All you need to know is it is used in, for toxins to diagnose um, bacteria that produce toxins, such as diphtheria, no, more specifically, botulism and tetanus. Of course, we can check the tot um, toxin for uh, for diphtheria because diphtheria makes toxin but we mostly use the ring um sorry we mostly use the um precipitin line test also known as the gel precipitin line test or the gel precipitin agar line test same thing but for botulism and tetanus if we talk about neutralization of a toxin please to be the neutralization reaction so we're going to go back to the questions we didn't do in the first lecture because we skipped some lectures so some questions because, as I said, so let's do the first question. Here they said a diagnosticum processed with sheep erythrocyte was absorbed on the by was absorbed by the antigen of Salmonella typhi. So a uh, sheep erythrocyte absorbed what Salmonella typhi antigen. A red blood cell absorbed. It was done in a lab. Yes, absorbed the Salmonella antigen typhi. What's test is this. Of course, it would be the indirect or secondary or passive hemagglutination test. Yes, because I told you here just now, here, that is that we process it, yes, 
That's why it's indirect. Yeah, it's not complement efficient test because I just explained complement efficient test to you. They didn't even talk about compliments. Yes, it's not precipitation because it's precipitation. It will either be what a scholar's test or um the precipitating line test. So the so the next one we didn't do yesterday was um forty five. To determine the toxicity of diphtheria, causative agents isolated from patient cultures are inoculated on a petri dish with nutrient agar on both sides of the centrally located filter paper strip, sodium with antidipteric antitoxin serum. After cultures, intubation in the agar between separate cultures and the filter paper strip, the sites of medium opacity were reviewed while surgical reaction is carried out. Of course, precipitation in gel. Yes. How do I know is 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 first of all is diphtheria and they're checking it does talk um the toxicity. Yes, even they didn't say the formation of lines. Yes, I told you that I, when I showed you, I told you that it's also known as the elix test. Yes, here, it's also known as the elix test. Yes, it's, it's done on a um as you can see, precipitating lines will form. It's done on a paper as this a filter paper yes or a petri dish you get the gist the question is too long serological diagnosis of infectious disease is based on specific antigen antibody interaction name the serological reaction which consists of microorganisms that clump under the influence of specific antibodies in the presence of electrolytes you are right. The answer is agglutination. Serological diagnosis of infectious disease is based on specific antigen antibody interaction. Name the serological reaction during which highly refined antigens are absorbed or put on red blood cell. You are right. The answer is indirect agglutination. Next question. Serological diagnosis of Infectious disease is based on specific antigen antibody reaction. How would the antigen sedimentation from the solution reaction be under the influence of an immune serum in the presence of an electrolyte? Okay, now the answer will be precipitation. They put electrolyte, of course, to confuse you. Yes, even if here they clearly stated that electrolyte is the electrolyte is for agglutination. Okay, and that's the issue in precipitation test. Precipitation test is also used um, when we want to detect um, bacterial species on food substances, where we want to detect if um, this liquid that was spilled is the blood of a person. Yes. But what do I know is precipitation? Because the key word in this question is what? Is sediments. I told you that sediment is for um, precipitation. Look here. You get the gist. Can you see that they say? You can see the actual separation of the liquid part and the um, the sediments, yes. But in agglutination, look here, oh, perfect. You can see that in agglutination, you can see there's no this um you can you can you can don't confuse that you can see that the background for this anti B is yellow. It's just the um the stain from the um from the material they are using. Yes, it's not a separation. So you can see that there's clumping. Yes, there's no actual actual separation. You can see here there's clumping. There's no actual separation. So that's the difference. So because they said here the sedimentation from the solution, so it's precipitation. Next question. Indirect fluorescent test has been used to detect tosoplasma antibodies. Yes, in the blood serum of a pregnant woman. At first, the fixed smell of the toxoplasma was processed with the investigated serum. What should the specimen be processed with at the following stage? So it's an indirect fluorescent test. And if you remember from my indirect fluorescent test here, what is it? Antigen, antibody, antibody with the fluorescent dye. Yes, so this is an indirect. So at first, they fixed the tosoplasma antigen with the serum containing what antibodies. Please, when they say serum, serum contains antibodies. Yes, they won't tell you antibodies, but no serum contains antibodies. So they have already fixed the antigen with the antibodies. So what next? Of course, it will be the serum. Yes, containing what antibodies or immunoglobulins that that is fluorated or stained with the dye. Yes, emitting light, which is same as flumescent. Yes, 
it will not be a recent solution because it's not specific. What solution? Is it a serum? Is it the first or second solution? Which one? So it's not specific. It's not um, serum containing fluorescent tosoplasma antibodies, yes, because if the serum is, con the, look here, good. This, let's say this is the tosoplasma, yes. So if you are saying the serum containing antibodies, what did they say? Serum containing um, antibodies to the tosoplasma. So it will be the direct, because it's the um, antibodies that is binding directly to the antibody. The antibody that is binding directly to the uh, toxoplasma, we call the what? You're right. Antibody um, against the toxoplasma. Yes. But this antibody indirect is binding to the primary antibody. I hope you get the difference. If in this indirect, the you only have the um, antibody that is stained with the dye is binding directly towards so the antigen. But in the indirect, the antibody that is stained with the dye is binding to the antibody. But here, the antibody that is stained is binding to the antigen. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. So that's why the answer is A, because the action was the next step. So the next step has to be the other antibody, so A. Okay, the other questions we didn't do. Blood stains are revealed in the clothes of a person accused of murder. What test can you use to prove that this body is a human? You are right. Precipitation, I just told you, yes. And also they talk about, there's a question in Krogos, they talk about food culture. And there's, I think they're in the market area and they want to check the presence of bacteria on a food to be precipitation. Pure cultures of diphtheria are isolated from a patient. What surgical test should you use to determine the toxigenicity of diphtheria? You are right, the Elix test, yes. And the Elix test is known as the word precipitation in agar or precipitation online test. Next question. A patient was diagnosed with hepatitis B, yes. To diagnose the disease, a surgical um, a serological reaction is based on the interaction of antigen and antibody chemically linked to an enzyme called peroxidase or alkaline phosphatase. I told you the enzyme in ASC is an enzyme. So what test is this? You are right, ELISA, yes, also known as enzyme immunoassay. Yes, I told you that the ELISA test here, as you can see, this yellow thing is the enzyme. A causative agent has been isolated from a patient with acute gastroenteritis. It should be identified by antigenic structure. What surgical test should be used? Now, if Croc is asking you to identify, um, is we want to identify, or what to yes, we want to identify, we want to identify that this indeed is this this like identify this is, for example, vibro cholera. So it will be agglutination test. But if they are asking you to confirm the diagnosis, yes, it would be a surgical or precipitation. I don't know if you get it. If you want, okay, I will I explain this more in detail as we are moving. But when you ask to identify the antigenic structure, so you want to you want to identify, you want to say why 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 do you say that this is Shigella? Because we are looking at the antigen. Yes, but how did they confirm the diagnosis? They would probably take your serum to check for antibodies production. Yes, so that's how we did. A patient, a patient with suspicions of chronic form of gonorrhea was admitted to the hospital. Choose a two-way system. That is a surgical method. So which surgical method? I would explain that is a two-step process. You are right, complement decision test. A patient was previously diagnosed with botulism and has been hospitalized. What surgical reaction should you use to treat, sorry, to determine the botulism toxin in the test specimen? So it's a toxin, yes? Neutralization. 